Good afternoon and welcome everybody to the latest in the series of the Deep Crawl webinars. My name is John Myers and I have the pleasure of hosting to today's webinar which is on scaling automated text generation for enterprise sites. So it's a big title, it's a big subject. Um, we've got a fantastic speaker on this subject today, Mr. Hamlet Batista, who is the CEO of RankSense. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to be with us, Hamlet. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, John. I'm excited no, to any, be here. Anytime, anytime. And it's great to see you as well. I was looking back over Hamlet's um, history on LinkedIn, as you do before you kind of get into these things. And this guy's been around since 2002 in search, so he's not only been around as long as I have. So, um, real knowledge, run some great businesses, some successful businesses around this subject, and obviously the latest being RankSense. Um, so, I'm really, really looking forward to this talk as well. So, I had a sneak preview of the slides, as you guys can imagine. It's going to be the usual format for our regular users out there. We're going to do around about 35 to 45 minutes of presentation, and then obviously we'll get into the Q&A. So please, 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 as always, get those questions ready. If you hear something that Hamlet says um, and you want to submit the question, submit your question as you hear it via the chat box, as you know, on the screen on the right-hand side, and do get them in as we go through the presentation, because then I can get them all racked up and uh, get ready for when we get around to the Q&A section. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions about this subject as always. The webinar, as always, will be recorded today um, and will be live on the Deep Crawl blog with a full recap, plus obviously the audio as per usual, uh, probably around about lunchtime, one o'clock tomorrow. Um, so please do watch out for that. And obviously for everybody that who is registered for the, the session, we'll email it out to you guys as well. And please, 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 we love the feedback. So as obviously the webinar closes off, the little window will pop up and ask for your feedback on today's session. Please take the time, it takes about 10 seconds and give us your feedback. If it's good, that's brilliant. If it's bad, let us know because we like to make sure we're improving these things. Uh, any subjects you'd like to hear about, any speakers you'd like us to get on board. We've kind of got a nice queue of speakers queuing up for these sorts of things. So we've got some of the best of the best, but we're always really interested in who you think should be the next one. Um, today really is all about tips um, around text generation for SEO. And there's some really cool ideas in the presentation. I'm not going to steal uh, Hamlet's thunder. And, you know, appreciate just obviously how you can scale and automate this at, at, on the enterprise level. So without further ado, that's enough from me. Um, I want to hand over to the floor to our speaker for the next sort of 35 to 40 minutes, uh, Mr. Hamlet Batista, uh, and let him talk you through the ins and outs of scaling automated quality text generation from enterprise sites. I'm really looking forward to this one myself. So over to you, sir, and Hamlet, and uh, looking forward to the presentation. Awesome. <clears throat> thank you very much for having me. So, Anytime. Yeah, thank you for having me today. I'm really, really excited about this topic. I'm, and if you guys follow my my articles on Search Engine Journal, Search Engine Land Watch, you've seen that I'm really, uh, you know, an advocate of getting uh, developer skills, learning about data science, machine learning, deep learning. And especially because it makes our job a lot more interesting. There's a lot of problems, especially for large sites, that <clears throat> when you combine them with a, with uh, some advanced skills, with some advanced knowledge, you can really solve them and 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 find innovative solutions. So today we're going to be talking about text generation, which is a really interesting topic. So let me make sure that I can. Move the slides. Okay, you're seeing the second slide here. So let's start from from a familiar place. Let's start by crawling a big enterprise site here that sells boats. And we're gonna we're gonna crawl a few pages from the site with our obviously with our friendly tool from Deep Crawl. And unsurprisingly, it's always possible to find missing tagging. You know, so we find. A simple crawl on this side, we're already finding titles and other descriptions that are critical for presenting compelling search snippets, right? But not only that, we're also seeing that there are some thin pages and empty pages. This was just a simple sample of a site, but I'm sure that if you run this on any, any particular site, we always find these type of problems. What is the common thing between these problems that we're lacking content? And especially with a large site, Putting this content together and keeping up with the changes that happen on a website, on a large site, is, is a tedious, you know, nobody wants to be doing that kind of work, right? So I have good news for you. We're going to fix that by leveraging 
the latest advantages in automation. So I wanted to use that to frame the whole presentation. And we are going to focus on four specific scenarios that are very common for enterprise sites. And we're going to focus in on two types of sites, e-commerce and web publishers, right? For e-commerce websites, we're going to look at two specific uh, examples of pages that have large images and no text and pages that have some large images and some text, which is typically the type of pages that you find in the e-commerce catalogs. You know the kind of category pages and the product pages and for web publishers we're going to look at pages that have a lot of text but they don't have quality metadata or pages that have very little text right and here is our agenda so in order to solve these problems with text generation we're going to explore some of the most fascinating approaches that are used right now primarily in academia which is you doing uh extracting text from images by captioning them automatically, asking questions from images and automatically and getting answers in text, text summarization, question and answering from text, which is also another interesting uh, way to generate text by answering questions. And some of the most uh, advanced approaches in text generation, which is long form question and answering, which which is where the answer is is actually a can be a paragraph or two or more, and something even more ambitious, which is full article generation. So this is really really exciting topics, and these are uh, the content is going to be heavy on the academic side of things, but I'm trying to always present the SEO side of the SEO side of things. What is how you make this stuff applicable in the context of what you might be working today. Okay. So in addition to this, we're going to be also building two models. We're going to be using Google Collaboratory to uh, build, learn to build a model that will generate captions and how to combine that with crawl data from the crawl. We're also going to build a state-of-the-art text summarization model. All this is code that you're going to be able to get access and use in your projects. And you know, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll be able to get answers to any questions you might have about this code as well. And at the end, I'm going to provide some resources uh, for you to learn more. Okay, so let's get started. So first of all is, uh, the cool thing about these topics is that Every day, every week, every month, there is always a new research, new code, new new paper that ex that advances the state of the art, that gets what was working before to perform even better. And one way to keep track of this, one of my favorite sites to keep track of this is called Papers with Code. And in the slides, you know, you get the links to the resources that I'm going to be sharing. This is a fantastic resource because not every paper, not every research that is public provides the code needed to reproduce the results. But a lot of this, a lot of papers do, and this is a, a place that actually makes that, you know, uh, accessible and not only accessible but also very organized. So, and they have one of my favorite things is that they have a section for the state of the art to where you can look at what are the top performing papers and ideas in different categories, computer vision, natural language processing, you know, all different topics. And you can just perform a search and find the relevant research paper and the code for any particular problem that you're trying to solve. And that's exactly what we did here. And I'm introducing you to this because that's exactly what I did to put together the, this presentation. So let's talk about uh, our, our first example, which is generating text when we have, you know, for an e-commerce site, when we have a big image and we have uh, very low value text, right? So this kind of text doesn't make for a good title or description, right? You know, it's not particularly enticing or useful, but we have a, a great image here. So how can we extract text from this image? And I'm not talking about transcribing the text here. I'm just trying 
I'm talking about how do you get a computer to generate a description of what is visible in the image, right? So our first stop is a state-of-the-art uh, paper called Bottom-Up and Top um, Top-Down Attention for Image Captioning and Visual Question and Answering. So this is the first paper, and papers will be will look intimidating at first because they have a lot of math, they have a lot of you know scientific notations and and terminology that you might not be familiar. But one of the great things about this particular paper and a lot of them is that they're becoming really accessible, including they have links where you can just kickstart the whole idea of the paper. And this and this is what we're starting with this one, which is you don't even need to fully understand what the paper is doing to even get to, to use it and make practical use. Uh, but we're gonna go over the concepts behind the papers as well. But the code that implements this paper is called uh, Pythia. And you can see examples of the capabilities of the paper. So the paper can, the, the code behind it in the paper, you can have an image, where you can actually ask questions from the image, which number is taking the shot, right? And the computer is able to tell you that it's 14. And it's, what is this cat wearing, right? Hat, right? And thinking about how do you, and, and we're gonna go into this into more detail, how do you make something like this more practical is that you could have templated uh, text for pages, where you fill in the blanks that you can complete, you can complete by asking a standard question. So you can have a standard questions, have it and ask those questions from an image and take those images and take those questions and fill in the blanks with the templates of the text. This is just giving you one idea of how you could use a question a visual question and answering service. Right. This is, you know, as I mentioned, very accessible. You don't even need to write code to use this. You can just, uh, in Colab, you can clone the repository here with this. You can type this comment in Colab, set it up, you know, exactly what I did. You can look at how good it is. Here's the results. Um, so the main, when he's talking about test dev accuracy, it's, you know, 68%, 69 might not look that impressive, uh, but it's actually in the in practice, it's actually very good. These are the, the results that you get, as we will see real soon. Uh, test dev means that the, that's the accuracy on on scene data. So you have the train validation, which is based on the training data that the that the algorithm is seeing. Test dev is the data that the is hold is hold is is held back. From the algorithm and still be able to answer questions very precisely. Um, and as I said, all this without even writing code, right? So how do we get started with this? So let's first look at how do we get the captioning part to work. So when I point it here, you just click here in the captioning B U T D. That's going to open a collab page, which is this one. You can make a copy in your drive, right? And it's gonna have a lot of code and instructions and you can just simply run all cells. You can just click here, run all cells, and that's gonna do everything for you automatically. It's gonna download the data sources that are needed. It's gonna run the training, the rain, run the training process, run all the steps that you will typically will have to do uh, manually. And then at the end, you get a, a a prompt to input your own image that you want to caption, right? Very simple, and that's exactly what we do here. So we just, without writing any code, we can type a, the URL of an image and run it in the notebook. You can type shift enter, and you're gonna get the caption of the image, right? And that's as simple as that. You already have a system that can take images from the web and generate uh, captions, generate uh, text just from, from the writing of the image, right? 
So how do we make this practical? As I mentioned, we have pages that don't have content. We can use the crawl to download all the images, right? Once we download those images, we can upload them back into the notebook. And I'm gonna leave that as an exercise for you to take those images and iterate over the function that does the captioning. And then you can just save it in a CSV. And now you have a lot of text from the images that you pull from the website. You can then filter them by the pages that are lacking the content, that are lacking the titles. And now you have new titles that you didn't have before without even having to type them, right? So if you think about it, that's that's really exciting, right? If you're using uh, Cloudflare on the website, you can also use our tool to test this these new titles that you've generated from the captions and learn whether they were effective, right? Before you put them right on the live on the website. So all the things that you can do as well, as I mentioned, is uh, ask questions from the images. So this is in the second link from Pythia. It's another de demo. Run all the cells, and then you can type the, your, the questions that you want to ask from the images, right? For example, here I'm asking how many people are in the boat, right? And he's making the predictions for has the highest confidence, right? So here we have what are the what are the people riding on, right? Boat, right? One of the things that you see is that this approach has to be combined with templates, as I mentioned before, because the answers are very very short. Right, so it's like one or two words, you know, so it's designed for short answers, right? But it's, for me, it's fascinating that a system can just look at an image and you'll be able to ask, you know, random questions about what's in the content on the images and come up with, you know, consistent answers, right? So this is, this is, this is fascinating for me, right? So how does the system works? And I don't, uh, to keep it uh, as high level as possible, what's happening is that these systems, if you've seen my articles, they use a concept called embeddings to encode the, the input information. So we have a combination of questions and images and potential images. And what they do is that they run this through a um, to a neural network, where the system for is encoding both the 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 text and the 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 questions and the images, and it's combining them and trying to figure out a model that gets the right the the answers right most of the time. Right, it's kind of like at a high level explanation of what is happening with this and with this system for me the, the the most interesting thing is this is one this is a state-of-the-art system is that here you can see the progression of how the system learns to identify for example this is the captioning system to identify um, what the image contains and this is a process that is called attention so attention in neural networks refers to the ability to focus on different segments of the input. In this case, you see when it learned that is the word two is highlighting the two, the two guys, right? And it's looking at there are two men, then looking that they're playing, look at it's focusing on the Frisbee to determine that it's playing, right? Right, playing Frisbee, the attention is focusing on the free speed, right? And dark, you see that is focusing on the on the area of the of the image. So this is very intuitive, what it's doing. But basically, this attention mechanism um, allows the system to effectively uh, learn what are the most important parts of the input that help the system learn what should be the best predictions that it's going to make. And this is just one of the most fascinating advances in, in neural networks, this attention mechanism, 
because it it makes things a lot more efficient and faster. Being able to to have a system that can focus on the right areas of the input to do this is it's just fascinating, right? So how do I learn about this, right? So I took this. This is uh, one course that I took after I completed uh, my deep learning specializations for both from Coursera and Ud and, uh, and Udacity. And it's an, it's an advanced course. And the final project of the first course of a seven part specialization is we were challenged to build an image captioning system. And I completed this last year and the approach is that, I, that we learned is actually a primitive approach by today's standards because we didn't even learn about it, the attention mechanism. But for me, it was interesting because being able to understand and build a system like this from scratch and learning how to combine a neural network that can work on images, like which is a, a CNN convolutional neural network with a recurrent neural network on RNN to produce the captions. For me, it was really an eye opening an eye-opening thing. And I encourage you to do things like this because once you learn this kind of stuff, you start opening your mind to other how to solve uh, problems that you're having in novel ways that you might not have considered before, right? So let's talk about our next, our next challenge. Okay, our next um, challenge is how do we, generate text when you have a lot of it, right? You have a decent amount of text, which is a problem with publishers, right? Um, and you might think that if you've seen, you know, um, this uh, approach of providing a single line of text and have the machine automatically generate the rest, you know, it's really amusing. If you go to this site, it's called talktotransformer.com. Uh, I put it in the future, SEO will never die. And then we completed everything else again. And then it started writing all these, all these uh, seems reasonable text. It seems uh, logically spaced, but if you read it, it makes no sense, right? So it's not really something that has practical use. Uh, if you want content that is actually useful and 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 quality, right? But I think this could be a good use if you're actually putting together a, a, a joke site, right? If you wanna put a, comp a competition for the onion, this is probably a great approach. So this is not the approach that I'm gonna be encouraging you to use, but it's good to you, for you to know about it. So the approach that we're gonna be talking about is, the first one is uh, text summarization, right? So how do we generate uh, summaries from long text? And we have, again, if you see, I'm going back to the source, which is the papers with code. So I can find some of the state of the art um, ideas and papers to, to do this, this task. There are two approaches, two primary approaches when you're doing text summarization. So you have abstractive summarization and extractive. Extractive summarization is refers to a system that can essentially rank sentences in the text. So you look at all the sentences in the existing text, the source text, and rank them based on how effective they'll be for a, to highlight a summary of the, of the whole article, right? And that's the most popular and, and practical approach and works really well. And especially because the, the text is mostly coherent and there is the abstractive text, which is making a lot of progress. It's, uh, it's, it's more challenging. The, the text generator feels a lot more fluid. It can come up with noble sentences, but it's, it also makes more mistakes, you know, the abstractive text summarization. So we're gonna be uh, building a model and we're gonna be focusing on extractive text summarization. And we're gonna use uh, this paper core, uh, called Fine Tune BERT for extractive summarization to do that. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through the process of how do you take a paper. This is a more, uh, a bit of a more challenging process than what we did for the captioning, uh, as we have to do a little bit more work, but I think you'll find it really interesting. 
So when I look at the paper, I saw first thing is you want to look at what the results are, how they how well they're performing. And you see that they outperform all their methods, but they have different options. And one of them, that's the one that we're going to focus on, is the BERT sum summary with transformer. It's the top performer, but also there is another option that performs very similar, right? So we're gonna we're gonna go through the process of putting this paper to work, okay? So the the second paper that this is another paper that is from Microsoft. We're gonna go we're gonna go into detail about implementing this one. This is for abstracted summarization, but I mentioned it here in case you want to try this idea as well. Uh, but abstracted summarization requires a lot more data, a lot of more time and computer power to do as well. And I mentioned it here is, is a paper from Microsoft. And they have also really great performance for the abstractive summarization task. Uh, I want to mention that the way that these papers work is that there is open data sets of articles from, for example, the one that we're going to be working on is from CNN and the Daily Mail. They have uh, large data sets of articles with uh, with uh, with their summaries that are used by the research community to find better uh, algorithms to perform the tasks. Um, there is also some other data sets, uh, but those are the some of the most popular ones. So let's start with our building our model for for extractive text summarization. So the first thing is we can click on the GitHub link here, right? Um, this is uh, the repository, BirdSum. We see the, the performance. Let me talk a little bit about the, the metrics here. Rogue, it stands for Recall Oriented Understory of Gisting Evaluation. That is the most popular metric when met because it's for summarization because it's the most popular. Uh, what it does it, is it measures uh, it compares the, the the generated summary against a what it, what is called a goal summary, which is the reference one, which is the ideal one, and tries to find the overlap between the 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 ideal one and what is generated by the computer, and it it penalizes two things: missing words that should be included, and also excessive words, things that should not be included. That's that's called in in the academia, precision and recall. So it measures both things, try to chrome up this metric for that. Um, so what we're gonna do to put this to work is we have to clone the repository in, in, in Google Collaboratory, and we're also gonna download uh, uh, the pre-processed data from uh, that, from, from, the, uh, from the data sets that we need for the training, okay? So we're gonna download that. I instead of downloading this to my computer and uploading it back into Google Collaboratory, I simply uh, selected the option because this is in Google Drive. Selected the option to save a copy in my Google Drive, and I'm gonna show you a little trick of how I can mount my Google Drive in Google Collaboratory so that I can access that data directly without having to download it to my computer and unload it in again. Okay. Um, and let's talk about, a little bit about what the model is doing. So the model is using, uh, is making a modification to the BERT encoder. If you're not familiar with BERT, bidirectional encoders, uh, representations for transformers is an, a, an encoding approach I recommend you check my article in uh, Search Engine Journal that talks, the latest one that talks about BERT. Um, and it's, a, it's an, an, an amazing approach to uh, encode uh, phrases in a way that re retains the, their context. Uh, what this uh, researcher did to that approach is he modified the way that BERT works so that it will be effective for specifically for the summarization task. So he made some changes that are outlined here and we're going to go into detail about the, what the changes are 
but that, that's at a, at, a, at a high level what he's doing. He's modifying BERT so that it could be effective for, for summarization. Okay, so now let's get to the to task. So we're gonna download the repository as I mentioned. This is simply following the steps outlined in the Git in the GitHub README, right? So we down clone the repository, install required libraries. We're using PyTorch for for this uh, for the training of this uh, neural network. Um, this is the trick that I'm talking about. So after I added the source. Uh, data to Google Drive. I can mount it by using this this little trick. I mount the Google Drive. It's going to ask me to. It's going to prompt me for an authorization. Click open another different window. Click uh, type back the authorization code, and you will see that that I'll be able to have access to the to the data that I need for my for my training. Okay. So I'm gonna go into the data, unzip it, right? Burst some data zip, and that, and then I'm gonna run a a Python script with a set of parameters that are also provided in the GitHub repository to start the training of the system. Okay, so I use some. Uh, some tricks because if when I start running running this, I have to run it for 50,000 steps with one GPU that you have for free in Collaboratory. That spans over a couple of days, and if you have worked with Colab in the past, you know that it disconnects. So you might lose your data if you just keep it on the on the on the computer that was running. So what I'm doing is I am saving the parameters or where to save the progress, which is the save checkpoint. I am mapping it to a directory within my Google Drive so that the progress is saved outside of the of collaboratory. When the machine disconnects, I can just um, restart the process from there. Okay. And I'm going to show you how the, that, that looks like. Right, so this seems a little bit scary. But this, this what I'm highlighting here, right? It's the same thing you get, and this is the instructions that you're getting. It's just copy and paste in the instructions. It's important to understand if you can what all these parameters mean, right? But it's not a requirement to get this to work. Okay, so you can get to work with this just with that information. So as I mentioned, resumming is critical. So this is how you resume. So you, there's another parameter, it's called train from, and you see that it's the drive that I mapped. And here is when I'm getting closer to the finish line, which is I'm resuming at the training step 49,000. And that's what I, that's what I, I was, I had to do that a few times to keep making, to continue our progress. Um, and after that is done, I was able to get the results, right? But let me give you a, a shortcut, right? So this is fun doing all this stuff. Um, but I also emailed the researcher and asked him for the pre-trained information. And that's even, that will save me a couple of days, right? Um, but I had already started. I didn't know if he was gonna respond right away, but this is great that he was, you know, that's just awesome putting together this in GitHub and doing the work, but also willing to share the, the train model. The train model that he gave me access was not the same one that I was training on uh, because I was using uh, the BERT one, the, and he uh, provided me with the code for this. So that's great. So this is the output. So you save it in the results. You can see the candidate, the gold, Summaries not very legible right now to do this, but here's here's one example. Right, so this looks really good. So you have click on the brilliant interactive graphic below for details on each hole of the master's twin. And then this is the the one that was generated by the by the machine. Right. And I provide a link to the collab notebook so you can actually follow my steps and see. Uh, but I find this to be really cool. So it put a little bit of time, but then you can reuse it to scale your efforts. So, so it's really, really exciting. So let's talk about the second example 
when it comes to text generation for um, for web publishers, where you have a little bit of text, only a little bit of text. So in that case, we're going to talk about using uh, question and answering to be able to generate that the that metadata based on that little text that you have. And the, the top performing model right now is called ExcelNet, uh, which is right now the outperform BERT. And uh, the model you see that is doing incredibly well. The main difference between ExcelNet and BERT is that is the way that they're trained. BERT works by masking uh, uh, parts of a sentence and trying to predict what was masked. It's like you're, it's like you're trying to learn by, you know, imagine yourself um, taking a quiz and trying to learn. You know, when you're studying for the quiz, you just put a hand on the answers and try to guess the answers yourself by, without having to see them, right? That's what essentially what BERT is doing at a high level, is trying to hide, the answers are already known, but it hides them so they can learn and try to predict them, trying to say, oh, is this this, and see how good it gets at, at answering them, and doing that in a, in a scalable way. Um, the advantage of that approach is that you don't need a lot of data, you don't need a lot of labeled data, manually labeled data to do this, because that's something that can be done automatically, hiding information and trying to predict it. It's a very effective approach. ExcelNet uses a completely different approach, which is based on permutations. So permutations is trying to predict based on all the possible combinations, but doing, the, doing that in an intelligent way, in an in a effective way, so that you don't have to, you know, expand a lot of time. So so these are two really interesting and different approaches. But they perform really well. We're not going to go through the process of training them and putting the code, but I wanted to mention those so you know what's out there for this. Uh, question and answering um, is similar with the image, uh, visual question and answering from image is something that should be complemented with templates, as I mentioned, because the questions, the answers are typically short in the traditional question and answering. Um, but something even more interesting that is happening, this still doesn't have a state-of-the-art papers and results. This is just a new challenge that, Google, that Facebook launched not even you know a couple of weeks ago to come up with the next level of question and answers, which is how do you come up with long answers, not just short ones? And this is really exciting about um, what's going to come out of this. Uh, right now, it's just a challenge. And uh, the basis for the challenge is that Facebook did the work to put together the data sets that the machine learning community is going to use to try to come up with good, al good uh, algorithms that can perform well for this. And, and Facebook is basing the research and the work for this on this subreddit called Explain Like I'm Five. And they have basically scraped the, the, the Reddit and created machine learning ready data sets that the research community can use to try to come up with algorithms that can answer answer questions like this by themselves, having the, the reference answers from these data sets. So this is really exciting and I'm looking forward to see what comes out of this. So I mentioned it here because you see how important it is just to keep track of the stuff, what's happening. Uh, so once we have papers and research that performs well on this task, then for the question and answering uh, algorithms, we won't need to use templates. We can just use the answers from the algorithm directory directly. So this is this is really exciting. And you see examples of the baseline that Facebook is providing using both, both extractive and extractive methodologies. You see how important it is to understand these concepts because they continue to be reused even as the state of the art advances, right? So this is, as I said, really exciting and interesting. So now let's talk about something a little bit more challenging and more, you know, and more ambitious. What about generating full articles, right? This is a really great and interesting research uh, about uh, how to generate full Wikipedia articles. And you see how what we've learned 
in the about summarization can be used for even more challenging and interesting and interesting tasks. So and basically what this approach does is it treats the article generation as a multi uh, summarization task. So essentially what it's doing is all the Wikipedia articles, you know, at the at the bottom of the article, they have a list of reference articles. So it says, OK, these are the sources that substantiate the claims in the articles. So that creates a very a structured way for a research group to try to um, systematize that into and build that into an algorithm. So what they're doing is they're taking the source articles referenced at the bottom at the bottom of the Wikipedia articles, and they're creating summaries of those articles, and then they are stitching those summaries together to put together the final article. So this is this is really exciting and fascinating, and this is what the output looks like. So you have this is the target. This is what the what it should be uh, the the article, and this is what the generated system did right it's not as good as it should be based on the on the final target but it's, it's showing a lot of promise on how good it's getting into getting closer to putting together that information so for practical purposes um you could use this both for problems in e-commerce or in publishing by having when you are um trying to put together in new content, uh, for example, for a category page, you might have multiple manufacturers with descriptions for their products and having a system that can take that and create summaries that can create a compelling a compelling page summarizing the different products that are being mentioned in the category, right? And similar when you have and another approach that I, this is something that I actually done, which is use these approaches of summarization or captioning on user generated content from from uh, from reviews or comments from users and turning that user generated content as a source for your summarization or captioning task and it works really well and it's it's another thing that you you can do and you you can do that you know I was able to do that because I I by doing this stuff myself I could see how I could apply these ideas and how I can uh, uh, replace things that were not working for others. So it's it's very effective. So here's the conclusion. Um, and you know, I found this 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 article to be really really interesting and exciting. Um, so here's the. So you say you know, is the code for this? Yes. This is this. You have the GitHub link if you want to play with this. I can tell you that it's going to be a multi-day effort to put this to place. So this is uh, so give you a sense of what are the costs of trying to implement this this uh, code in, in Google Cloud. Uh, so it's not it's not cheap, but it's you know certainly very interesting. Uh, here are some resources that I think you will find useful if you want to learn more about this topic. And yeah, thank you very much for your time. I hope you find great value out of it. Thanks, Hamnet. Um, mind blowing. Um, really, really interesting stuff. And um, we've got some questions, which is great. Um, really enjoyed just listening to you talking through those theories and stuff like that. As you say, it's it's very academia, but you can really see the the, the applications to the things that you know when you see like the Daily Mail example and stuff like that of generating those texts. Uh, into the articles, um, I can really see the proven value in that. Um, as I say, what's always great to see is we we have questions, which is which is always nice. Um, and I always like to start with um, the, the person asked the first question at the end of the day. It was Jerry Jones, uh, who just basically, as you were starting to get into all of the stuff and going through the theories and stuff, what just what's your preferred source of finding new stroke interesting papers? Obviously, you gave a great list there at the end of the presentation. But is there a source which is your kind of go-to place to 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 get your hands on this sort of stuff? Yeah. So, so my best um, my best source is Twitter, and it's you know if I follow uh, AI researchers, um, 
I will I will try to share a list of them because I don't I don't keep track. But there is a, a good number of of uh, AI researchers that tweet a lot of the latest stuff, um, and and that's how you always you know there if you if you follow if you follow my tweets related to the AR you see that I retweet this stuff that I find really really interesting. Um, uh, Hacker News I think sometimes they share some interesting stuff that what's happening. Um, and you know, following the AI blogs and tweets from Facebook, uh, uh, Google, uh, Stanford, Stanford NLP. Uh, okay. Oh, let me tell you one of the one of the best places for ideas is is the research projects from the Stanford uh, NLP class. Uh, so after they graduate. You can have like 60 or 80. You know, you have a lot of really, really interesting projects because all these uh, kids mm -hmm. completing those those uh, classes are uh, coming up with really interesting and challenging uh, projects, and they make them public. So that's also a good source of that. Fantastic. Um, this isn't a question, but it's uh, Koji Kawano. Hopefully, I pronounced that right. Uh, so great to hear you took a data science specialization course at Casera. So that's that's obviously nice to hear. Um, Great. Then just looking at um, Simon Cox said, you know, just going back to uh, Pythia, um, what is the minimum viable number of images that makes using Pythia worthwhile compared to manually doing this? Um, one image. Yeah, is that so? Pythia oh, is already. <laughs> yeah, Pythia. Yeah, yeah. That what I show there. I I didn't have to do. You know, I just exactly the steps that I provided. You don't have to create your image uh, data set to use Pythia. Just what I show, you put the image that you want to evaluate and it will provide you the, the output. Now, what's happened is if you use Pythia just like that, the descriptions are not going to be personalized to your use case. They're not going to be personalized to your clients. They're not going to be personalized to your site. So that's where a little bit of work will help you customize the descriptions so that they better match uh, the you know the messaging that you want on the website so that's where you for example you could use deep crawl on a, on a few sites or a few of the, of the competitor sites and build a list of images and match them up with uh, even text from the google ads yeah. and or for example plas you could scrap plas and get both the uh, that's the the product names or the descriptions plus the image that is also included in the PLAs, and then use that as your data set that you're going to feed into a, a captioning model in the refining stage. So the refining model means that it already was trained to produce captions, but they're going to be generic ones. You want them to be personalized. You fine tune it on your small data set. And I don't fine tune it on captioning on, I think, three, I mean, four or five thousand images is good enough to get the system images plus the the captions that are trained on, right? And yeah, that's enough to generate great ones. Yeah, it's interesting, and that's an interesting another use case when you start talking about PLAs on the paid side of stuff as well. That's, that suddenly becomes quite an interesting play. Exactly, um, and that's what I'm saying. You know, sorry to interrupt, John. That no, no, that's no why that's what I want the community to get involved with this because the the academic the research community don't know anything about PLAs or they don't know anything about any of that stuff, right? So we bring our domain knowledge, combine it with this research, and we find a lot of novel use cases that solve a lot of problems that we have, mm. right? Well, I couldn't agree more, absolutely. Um, Darius uh, Kajtok says, thanks, Hamlet, for a nice intro to Applied Deep Learning. Uh, I love research Great. stuff, new ideas coming each week. Uh, but what he's saying is he has a huge problem with generating business value from those solutions. Um, do you know who or which organizations might directly benefit from automatic image captioning or text summarization? I think it's, uh... Yeah, that's that's a good um, that's an excellent that's an excellent question. And mm -hmm. in our case, what we've done with this research, how do we make the you know? Uh, translatable into business value is by writing uh, compelling search snippets, increasing the click-through rate of the organic search results. And in order to do that, 
you what we've done is we're taking uh, reviews from products that five star reviews. So the five star reviews, the text from the from the five star reviews, are typically benefit driven. So the 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 the, the, the writers are going to be highlighting why the product is great, right? Yep. So then taking that and build and 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 matching it with the product image and fitting it into the fine tuning layer of a captioning system will train the system to generate better uh, titles or descriptions than the ones that you will write manually because these are trained on the highlights of the benefits of the users. That's just giving you an example that, you know, of how you translate this into, into business value because when you explain to a, to a decision maker, you know, they will understand, yeah, I can see why that's gonna, drive higher and more valuable clicks because I'm presenting a text that is, you know, that was trained on user benefit driven copy from users that are bra bragging about how, why yeah. the product is great, right? Yeah. So it's just that okay. you have to, the academic alone is not gonna do the business for you because academic people don't know anything about business. They don't know anything about ROI. They don't know anything about that. You have to bring that context yourself. That's what I'm saying that you as a practitioner learn this stuff, but you can just use this stuff like academic people use it because that's not going to drive the business is combining it with your expertise. As I mentioned, the PLAs, I mentioned the user reviews, you know, the ads the you have a lot of sources of data of what drive results on SEO, but you have to combine that with your research to turn it into business value. No, I couldn't agree more. And I think that's the key in the whole of this sort of thing, obviously not to get kind of, hung up on the academia side of things, but actually take this, embrace what they've they've created as models and actually, you know, actually implement that into what we do as marketers. And, um, you know, I think that's a, just a really great way of framing it. Um, Ilya Moscovoy asks, just have you ever tried monkey learn out of interest? Uh, no, I haven't tried monkey learn. No. Okay. That was a quick, no. um, <laughs> quick and easy answer to that one. <laughs> um, so yeah, I assume, I assume that is a, uh, a plug and play ML toolkit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The reason why I don't use the 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 plug and play EC ML uh, systems is because they're the limiting things. They they are great for for predefined use cases, but typically I'm trying to find novel things to do, and and I don't like to be constrained. This is the main reason. But you know, if you if you feel like if you enjoy it, you know, you know definitely go with it then but it's going to limit there. your ability to do really advanced stuff no oh, brilliant i think then just a follow-up question to that is from sarab uh Bust, who's basically asking the question of what's the best resource would you recommend to learn python for a non-coder uh the best resource um yeah that's a great question i think i oh uh kaggle i think kaggle released a um a full resource to get Python from scratch to to data scientists, to data science. I'm going to try to add that to the resources. I don't have the link with me right now, but I will try to add it to the resources. Yeah, fantastic. Well. Really appreciate yeah. that. And um, it's just good. It sounds like people want to get, get into this and get started. So that's a good thing. Um, that's the idea. That's the idea. So yeah, I'm excited to hear that. Really, really, really excited. I think yeah, it's it, it, go on. Sorry. Go for it. Ahmed. Yeah. And feel free because I get it, you know, you might feel, you know, intimidated um, that you wouldn't want to ask me questions. I get a lot of direct messages. My direct messages on Twitter are open, and I get asked the same question over a lot of times about how do I get this or I try to do this. You know, I'm happy to help because you know I want the community to get involved with this. I just want my articles, my webinars, to be just a spark. I need the whole community to build great stuff and 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 build this into a a more exciting place to be. Yeah. Fantastic. There you go, everybody. Just DM, DM Hamlet and um, get the answer that you need because you're absolutely right. Sometimes people don't want to ask the question in the open forum. Well, the obvious question is being asked in some ways as well. Uh, Morad Wojtek asked the question, do you think Google Teams can detect text generation? Um, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> there is some research. Yes, a simple answer. Yeah. Uh, there is uh, research on on how to detect uh, computer generating, especially because now it's not as great as it could be. And, and there's uh, common mistakes that computers make. 
or common patterns that they do repetition and some other stuff so it's, it's, it's possible so yeah that's so, good. yeah so they it's it's always interesting just to see and then obviously it's then the perception is what does google make of it and, and so on and so on and so on um yeah i mean in in essence i i don't think that captioning where you are uh providing value you know i mean i don't think that google has a problem with the generation it's just how you use it right if you're using it to just you know generate gibberish like i show with tactus transformer or not really trying to help users you're going to have a challenge with that right so i don't i don't see a problem with google respecting a good use of the technology uh, yeah, especially because they are the, the biggest spear herders of the of the ai and uh everything that is happening now oh, which is a really really good point um definitely and uh, I mean, to be honest, we're, we're out of time. I mean, it's six o'clock now. We, we've got other questions. So what we'll do is like what we normally do, because I'm conscious, obviously, it's six, six o'clock in the UK and people tend to want to kind of make that move for home and stuff like that. And certainly in Europe, it's seven o'clock and so on. So we're going to call it on time tonight. And um, as I say, we have some other questions for some other people. What we'll do is we'll we'll shoot those over to to Hamlet. And get a quick answer for you guys as always and add that to the to the wrap up uh, tomorrow so you can get your answers because there's some, some quite nice ones here that we could carry on talking for for a little while on hamlet so if you don't mind if that you could yeah, spare us a quick five to ten minutes to, to stick one line against each one that would be would be amazing absolutely um, obviously a massive thank you to to everybody that's attended today um you know we we keep putting these on and it's great to see that we get great attendance and uh, having you guys listening in and interacting and appreciating you know what the speakers are saying is fantastic and obviously a massive thank you to to hamlet today for to taking the time obviously he's he's east coast based in the us in the middle of the day so i'm sure there's lots going on so a massive thank you to you sir for taking the time to be on the deep thanks call. for Everyone. you guys no thanks for you for having me it was, it was a blast and had a lot of fun putting this together and learn a lot myself as well as every fantastic. time I think of something. Brilliant. As mentioned, obviously, guys, there will be a full recap of this tomorrow on the Deep Call blog, uh, including the questions, including the audio, including everything that's happened and top tips. So you know, watch out for that. And obviously, if you have signed up, we'll be emailing that out to you guys as well. And obviously, please, please, please do fill in the survey. As I mentioned at the start, we really do appreciate the feedback and you guys are usually really good at giving it. So please give us that feedback, good, bad or otherwise, and uh, give us some tips of things that we could maybe do in the future. Um, but uh, I really appreciate if you could just take that 10 seconds when you guys sign out to do that for us. Um, watch out, obviously, for our next webinar. We're into the summer period now. Um, there's lots going on. So our next webinar will be announced very, very soon for September. We're just locking down some dates because uh, there's lots of events and things going on as everybody kicks back into gear in September after the summer break. My name is John Myers. I've really enjoyed hosting this one today. Big thank you to Hamlet again. And I look forward to Thank hosting you. the next webinar and, and speaking to you all uh, very soon on uh, the next one. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a great day.